Let's bring in Tom Pelissero. Tom, thanks for uh, being patient. Uh, let me ask you the question that we've been uh, mulling over. Um, you can have any player in the history of the sport to start your team with, non-quarterback. And I'm getting them at the start of their career, yes. like draft eligible. They're 21 years old. Yeah. Pretty hard to go against Lawrence Taylor in a, a discussion like that. I'll default to the wisdom of Bill Belichick and say there's not been many better players than that in NFL history. Yeah, we brought up Reggie White. Like I'm, I'm getting longevity if I factor that in. I'm, I'm getting twice the, the career, at least length, with Reggie White. So I, I see what Paulie said where I'm getting a guy who's defensive player of the year 27 and 37. Jerry Rice would also be in there as well because I'm getting longevity as well. But uh, having seen Lawrence Taylor up close and personal when he came into the league, I couldn't imagine being a quarterback. I mean, I saw him in a preseason game, Tom, against the Jets and Ken O'Brien. I felt he was playing like it was the Super Bowl. I felt bad for Ken O'Brien. I could actually see fear in the face of a football player. (laughs) I was born in 1981, so I don't obviously remember the early stages of Lawrence Taylor's career, but I do remember even later in his career when, you know, there was a lot of different stuff going on with him. He was still a fearsome player and, Again, I've just listened to Bill Belichick talk many times about him and just the attitude and the physicality and, you know, the athletic ability that he brought to the field. And then you just go, you watch the old highlight clips, yeah. and it's like he's, he's from a different planet in those. You know, he's got the enormous shoulder pads that I think makes everybody look smaller, yet somehow he looks like this enormous figure who just kind of engulfs these quarterbacks. But also he changed, if, if you look at, at um, you know, offenses, a defensive player changed offenses uh, in how they blocked him. So you'd have the tight end and the tackles stay in. You know, Joe Gibbs did that with Washington. I don't know how many other football players where, you know, the offenses had to change their philosophy just to stop a defensive player. Um, you know, Lawrence Taylor stands out to me, obviously. Um, maybe Dion with what he did, how he did it, taking away half the field. But can you think of another defensive player that, offenses had to try to figure out how to stop? Well, throwing away from, from Dion, I mean, that was a, a big piece of it. Um, you know, flipping over to the offensive side of the ball, defenses had to change for Randy Moss. I mean, the year in 1999, I believe the Packers used their first three picks on cornerbacks just to try to figure out what they were going to do with them. <laughs> now, he was very much a straight line speed type of guy. Where he just, but he could get over the top. He could win 50 50 balls. He could beat you down the field. You'd get the ball in his hands and he could do some, you know, freaky stuff. You think back to his punt return days and the other things he could do. I mean, he was a, a rare, rare athlete. And, you know, classic example of that process, he slid in the draft for a variety of reasons, everybody, even though everyone knew that he was an absolutely hellacious player. Um, but, if, you know, if you're talking about starting your franchise with somebody, well, Randy played for a few franchises, and there were reasons behind that. But you talk about, you know, Reggie White, 10 years apart, being the defensive player of the year. Randy Moss had two of the greatest seasons we ever saw in 1998 and 2007 after a venture to uh, the Raiders for a couple of seasons uh, there in between. I mean, I've never seen a, a better rookie receiver in my lifetime than Moss, and I'm not sure I've ever seen a player have a better season than he did uh, when he joined up with Tom Brady in 07. NFL Network's coverage of the draft from Vegas kicks off Thursday at 8 Eastern with the first round. Where's the drama in the draft, Tom? Everywhere. <laughs> That's the simplest way to, to put it right now. I know that you don't have the clear-cut number one quarterback. You don't have the sexy skill position guys who are going to get drafted really high. You've got some really you know good, solid players up at the top of the draft, guys like Aiden Hutchinson, highly productive. Um, all signs point to have him having a really long and, and good career. Uh, but the fact that we're sitting here talking about a guy in Trayvon Walker, who granted has unbelievable traits, um, but had, I believe, nine sacks in his entire college career at Georgia, being the number one overall pick, that's just that's indicative of just kind of the uncertainty that you have in this draft. Uh, it, a lot of that is driven by the quarterbacks. There's, uh, in just talking to all the GMs and head coaches I have over the past 48 to 72 hours here, everybody's trying to figure out at what point uh, the quarterbacks begin to go. That is absolutely going to be some of the driving drama, certainly in our NFL network coverage, as much as 
you never want to uh, knock the the offensive linemen. You know, the fact that you could have three or four offensive tackles in the top ten is not exactly going to be, you know, the peak of excitement. But, you know, when does Malik Willis go? When does Kenny Pickett go? Uh, when does Desmond Ritter go? The, these guys, Sam Howell, they're ranked in all different ways across different boards. I had a phone call last night uh, with a head coach who told me, he thought Desmond Ritter is going to be the best one out of all these guys, <laughs> which you haven't heard anywhere because everyone's talking about Willis or Pickett as the top quarterback. There's just there's so much uh, you know opinion that goes into this, and different teams have different ways of evaluating things. I think there's drama all over the place. It just might not feel like going into the draft. You have the same drama because we don't know that there's one, two, three quarterbacks that are definitely going to go in the top five. All right, we have a bet here in house that uh, my producer, Paulie, thinks a quarterback will go in the top 13 picks. That's a pretty good over-under if we're, <laughs> if we're setting such things uh, here in Vegas. Uh, you know, the hot spots would seem to be you've got Carolina and Atlanta at 6-8 and eight respectively. Both those teams are threats to take a quarterback. That seems rich for both teams to take a quarterback. But you heard Scott Fitterer, the Panthers GM, saying yesterday that the sweet spot for a trade down would be somewhere in the teens. Well, where do the other threats lie? You've got the Saints who own 16 and 19. You've got the Steelers who own 20. If you're a team that's going to trade down and still try to get a quarterback, you're not going to want to drop below those picks. And if you're a team that's trying to come up, you're probably thinking you've got to get ahead of certainly Pittsburgh, uh, but also New Orleans as well. And that's kind of the, the gamesmanship that goes into this. And it's why you know, right now, you know, sometimes there's reports about this team's getting calls or making calls about trading down. Well, Odds are they're also making trades about their calls about trading back. They're having conversations with all these different teams to figure out, okay, what would the price be if we did this? And because, again, you have so much less certainty at the top of the draft, there are way more scenarios that these GMs are having to talk through just because if it comes to you on the clock, you've got to be prepared to take a player, but you've also got to be prepared for a lot of different scenarios that can play out based upon what's happened in the few picks ahead of you. Okay, I want you on record. The quarterback and the team. Who takes the first quarterback? The team is a difficult one, Dan, and predictions are a dangerous aspect of the business. If you are saying the safe pick, how about this? The safe bet is going to be that the New Orleans Saints, with one of their two picks at 16 or 19, take a quarterback. Okay. That's not to say that they will. I'm not reporting that they will before anybody tweets that quote. What I'm saying is, I think a lot of people focus on the Steelers, but don't overlook the Saints. They did a ton of work on all these quarterbacks. Uh, they had private visits uh, with a bunch of them. They're in a position where they brought back Jameis Winston. He's making you know decent money. I want to say it's $14 million a year uh, base, but it's certainly not top of the echelon starter money. And you're starting over with a new head coach in Dennis Allen. So it would make sense. Uh, if I were betting for you know any team, let's take New Orleans out of it for a second, if I had to pick one quarterback to go first, I would say based on all my conversations, the best bet is Malik Willis from Liberty, simply because there are a bunch of coaches who have said similar things to me, which is he's the only guy who has those elite traits. This is a Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen world. Hmm. You can watch Kenny Pickett. He's running a pro-style offense. He's making every throw you want to see. Had a great final year at Pitt where he was for, you know, six years. He started like 50 games there, but broke out last season. Um, you know, a little bit like Joe Burrow in that he doesn't have the elite arm, uh, but he's accurate enough. He's got really good leadership traits, smallish hands. Uh, but it's where's the upside with Kenny Pickett? With Malik Willis, the floor is much lower than it is on Pickett, but he, Willis won over a lot of people through, obviously, his workouts. He's got a cannon arm, really good running ability, innate playmaking ability. You watch his highlight tape. It's unbelievable some of the throws he makes. But he's coming from a super simplistic offense at Liberty, much like what Sam Howell ran, much like what Matt Corral ran. Uh, is he going to be able to make his game translate over? And when he played you know, legit opponents, like top 25 type of opponents, he had two games against them, Ole Miss and Coastal Carolina, I think, were the two. They beat Coastal. They lost to Ole Miss. But Malik Willis had, like, no touchdowns and five interceptions in those two games. Ran for five touchdowns. But those are all things that you're taking into account here. You're projecting the traits. The traits are there. He's shorter, but the traits are strong. You're just wondering, can he make the leap? And where he impressed people in his interviews was both on the board and in his personality. Guys, people kind of think, much like Trey Lance a year ago, 
They think this guy can do it. You're betting on the person as much as you are the player. I'll leave you with this. Uh, who has a new team first, Debo Samuel or Baker Mayfield? The smart money there would be on Baker Mayfield. And sorry for all these gambling puns. I'm really not trying to do it. I think it seeped <laughs> into my veins after several days here at the Cosmopolitan. Uh, the smart money would be on Baker Mayfield just because everyone knows that the Browns you know, are in a position where they probably have to deal him. You never say never about them holding on to him into camp or even having them start the season, depending on what happens with Deshaun Watson and whether there potentially could be an NFL suspension, that investigation's ongoing. But they're going to get calls probably most likely after round one when people see where those top quarterbacks ended up going. So Baker Mayfield could be something. It could happen before the draft, too. But most likely Friday is when the leverage points are going to line up for a potential trade. With Debo Samuel, there absolutely are teams interested um, I can tell you there's multiple offers that have been made. The people in the league who know Kyle Shanahan best do not believe he's going to trade this guy. Kyle doesn't want players to be calling their shots. Debo is also somebody who he's told his own team. Kyle has told his own players in the past, this guy is probably the best player I've ever been around. And he can do so many different things in that offense. Mm an offense that really revolves around being able to run the same plays over and over out of a lot of different personnel groups. That's why Kyle Juszczyk's so valuable to him. That's why Debo's so valuable to him. He doesn't want to let the guy go, but they're going to have to make a determination sooner than later, and most likely it would have to be today just because then you need to work out the contract, the compensation. Ideally, you'd physical him before the draft begins tomorrow to finish off the trade as well because uh, you're going to be talking about uh, a first-round pick and more being involved in that trade. It's going to have to get moving if it happens, and I'm not saying it won't. I would just tell you the people who have talked to Kyle, the people who know how he and John Lynch think, are skeptical that he's actually going to let the guy go. Thank you, buddy. Have a good time, Tom. We'll be watching. Anytime, Dan. Thanks. That's Tom Pelissero. He's a reporter for the NFL Network, and you can watch the coverage on the NFL Network. It's 8 Eastern tomorrow night. First round.